Arms companies fuel war for profit. People will wonder in the future why and how it was that people tolerated this industry, which is responsible for pouring down death on innocent human beings around the world. I hope that when the arms industry is abolished, that people can look back and see among the actions which ended the arms industry will be this little action in this little town which we undertook. There are lots of types of civil disobedience. If you take physical action of a very violent kind, it is revolutionary, it is intended to change the, the government. But people who take action which is designed to draw attention to an injustice, but don't want to kill anyone, then you're in a very interesting area. And I think that what the Raytheon people did was to establish in law that they had no obligation to obey a law that was contrary to their conscience. For all of my lifetime and longer, Derry has been a place of very high unemployment. The town was starved of investment and starved of jobs because there was a Catholic majority here. And it was that feeling of being discriminated against which gave rise to the civil rights movement, which was demanding equality, and which came onto the streets in 1968. The significance of that movement was the sense in which Derry people felt themselves connected to the struggle for justice um, right around the world. The reaction of the state here to the civil rights movement, the brutality of the reaction, which prompted uh, people involved in the civil rights movement, or some of them, went to take to more drastic measures. Again, it's not the full story, but in a way that's where the IRA campaign came from. And of course, the troubles, in theory at least, came to an end with the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. And people in Derry were told that jobs would be created here as a result of the peace process. The Raytheon arrived in Derry in 1999, the year after the Good Friday Agreement was signed, uh, the announcement of the opening of the Raytheon uh, plant here was made by John Hume and David Trimble, which was the first thing they did after receiving their Nobel, Nobel Peace Prizes. And at the time, John Hume said that uh, Raytheon would be welcomed with open arms by all the people of Derry. The Raytheon factory, an arms company, was going to set up in Derry uh, as part of the peace dividend. And of course many local people, and not just radicals and civil rights uh, activists sort of could immediately see the irony in an arms factory being established as part of the peace dividend. Raytheon coming to Derry was a denial uh, and an affront to all the things that, that Derry stood for, you know, going right back to the start of the civil rights movement. We live in a city that suffered the results of war for 30 years. People here know what it's like to see their loved ones die because of a war. The idea that we could actually sit here and have as part of our peace dividend to be that we were going to bring murder and, and, and massacres to other countries, we just couldn't accept that. What finally prompted the uh, occupation of Raytheon was uh, the bombing of Cana in southern Lebanon. When we heard that it was a bunker buster <laughs> bomb, which had caused uh, that massacre in Cana, we are immediately aware that that was a Raytheon bomb because Raytheon is the sole supplier of such weapons to Israel. On the news, we could see the carnage of Cana. We could see the babies being brought from the rubble of this building and dripping bundles. And we knew that this company that made those bombs had, had a plant two miles down the road. The people of Cana were not distant people from us. You know, if we're concerned about oppression in the world, the people of Cana were our neighbours. The children were the children of our neighbours. So we did it out of a... We occupied Raytheon, if you like, out of a neighbourly duty. The people's flag is deepest red, it shrouded off the mass of day. And ere the limbs grew stiff and cold, their hearts blood died in every fold. Then raised the scarlet standard high, beneath its folds we'll live and die. Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer, we'll keep the red flag flying here. So we were sitting in Sandino's bar, which is where we had 
the meeting at which we first talked about the Occupy and the, the factory. We talked about uh, the possibility of taking out the mainframe computer, which we believe, that has turned out to be true, uh, would disable not just the dairy plant, but might disable other Raytheon plants, and in the event it did. 25 of us uh, assembled at 8 o'clock in the morning of the 9th of August, uh, which by coincidence uh, uh, was the exact anniversary of the bombing of Nagasaki. We went down to the Raytheon plant. Uh, we didn't know whether we were going to get in. As it happened, getting into the plant was very easy. I mean, people were coming into work, sort of to work in another uh, employment which was in the same building. And as the security people opened the door to allow the workers in, we just made a rush for it and uh, we got in. Wednesday, 9th of August, 2006, possible foil DCU. At the uh, Raytheon building, there's a number of persons inside have taken over the building and are throwing items, uh, computer disks, paper, etc., onto the roadway. I was prepared for maybe just blocking the outside doors if that's all we could have done to have got through the doors and smashed the front door and got in barricading ourselves and I was really relieved that we thought we'd, that we'd done that. We got all the furniture was in, we put it up against the doors. We definitely had a real feeling, and I know certainly from a few of us, you know, that, that we were going to, do a lot of, going to do a lot of damage or as much damage as we could. Taking the computers apart, throwing them out the window, smashing all the computers and we attacked the mainframe computer physically smashed it and used a fire extinguisher on it until we were certain that it wasn't working anymore and that we had actually cut the plant off from communicating with any other part of the Raytheon complex. For me, uh, the, the target obviously is the mainframe computer. You know, see when that was done, right, and it was done, it was done right, right away, basically. That's what I went for. Uh, I sat back and I thought, what else could we do here? The person known to me as uh, Eamon McCann, he was quite relaxed, he's not in any uh, aggressive mood. It was like a remarkably short period of time in which all, all that happened, sort of happened in the first first half hour. And I remember, uh, hunger said on one stage, I remember, <laughs> with a few sweets and stuff. I mean, we were in touch with the media throughout, I mean, with mobile phones, I mean, and actually in the middle of the occupation I did a live interview with the local BBC. <laughs> Eamon McCann is now giving a speech to the uh, assembled press people. On the line is Eamon McCann, who's inside the building, as I understand it, uh, along with members of the Foil Ethical Investment Campaign. Eamon McCann, good morning to you. Good morning, Paul. Uh, well, what's happening? A bit of noise there, just uh, as we came across there. Is what, what's happening at the moment there? Well, there is a, a group of us inside the uh, Raytheon uh, plant uh, here at Springtown, there's about, I think, eight or nine inside. There's about 20 people uh, outside. And uh, we've taken this action to, we're disrupting as far as we can the operation of the Raytheon uh, company here in Derry. And we're trying to dramatize the fact, if you like, that uh, Raytheon as a company is inextricably linked into the Israeli military machine. It has a role in the horrible violence which we see, or a little bit of which we see, uh, on our television screens every night and I think it's a widespread feeling that people just want to be doing something about it. This wasn't simply a sudden protest against Raytheon or a general protest against the arms industry. It was a specific attempt to have a practical impact on what was happening uh, in Lebanon. The next significant thing that really happened in that morning was that these hostage negotiators arrived from Belfast, which made me think, my God, this is a really serious thing. This is like something you see in a film. Which rather took us all aback because we thought, good grief, I mean, why do they need negotiators from Belfast? But then it turned out that they actually thought that we were probably armed, that this was going to be an armed siege. Part of my job was to just keep the negotiators talking to prevent the police coming, coming in with their cutting equipment. And meanwhile, outside, we were all really frightened. We'd all been pushed back out of the car park. We've actually sold it again. I don't have them at all. Go to the gate. I'm coming back again. Do you think I'm leaving the car up there? And then we saw these huge cars going in with all these guys with balaclavas up um, and dogs in the back of them. So we just thought, oh my God, they're going to. What are they going to do to them? I just got up and looked over at all the barricades that we had at the doors, and the whole corridor, for as far as you could see, it was just all these big black <laughs> helmets with visors, you know what I mean? The place smashed through. They used a chainsaw to cut their way into the place. And they came in dressed and 
riot gear with visors and plastic bullet guns shouting, protesters, we call upon you to surrender and stuff like that. It was ridiculously dramatic. By this time we were playing cards because we were bored. We are in there for eight hours. We had done everything we would come to do. So we were playing cards. I don't know what imminence they have, but I had a full house. Carson <laughs> <laughs> But they came and arrested us all, threw us on the ground, handcuffed us behind our backs, frog marched us or escorted us or dragged us from the premises and uh, took us to jail. The night in Coleraine Police Station was the worst. It's that feeling that you always get when you're in, you're in custody, you know, the feeling of complete powerlessness. As soon as we started destroying the equipment, we knew we were going to be arrested here and we might well go to jail. The discussion in the cell all morning, you know, it'd been, oh, we're never getting out of here, we're never getting out of here, and uh, that sort of thing. I remember you singing in Coleraine Police Station. Uh. Say, oh, they you were singing <laughs> Joe Hill or something, which is lovely, you know what I mean? But I tell you, I felt very lonely in that cell. They're in the local cop shop one night, and then they're in McGabry prison for 36 hours basically and those two nights I think were probably two of the worst nights of my life not being able to explain to our daughter where her dad was but when I went to bed that night I just thought this is what it would be like if he was dead because there's just no way of contacting no way and I really for the first time understood what it must have been like for people who did have family in prison. The court decided to take the trial and send it to Belfast because the prosecution argued, they argued that uh, all of us, but myself in particular, they said, said that I was a very popular person in Derry and the jury in Derry would be biased in my favour. I had the weird experience of hearing my own barrister jump to his feet and said, oh no, uh, my lord, uh, this, you can't say that this man's terribly popular in Derry. He's not popular at all. Indeed, he has stood for election on a number of occasions and got a derisory vote. I, I was a bit concerned about the, what the family had thought of me, you know. But I mean, in the court the next morning, where me and Collins were up together, yeah. and I mean, just turned around and seen the family at that, and just went to got there and clapped them. Oh, yeah. I thought it was fine, like, to see that level of support. Sure. And uh, I felt on the kid at that moment. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's outrageous about the, 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 the media coverage. It was an endless source of frustration to us when preparing for the trial and trying to mount the defence campaign. Mm. We were blasted through at the media, you know, with all the coverage we uh, had as thugs mm. and vandals. Mm. You know, mm. have I not got better things to do yeah. with my time? Yeah. But Come up, take off work and go through it. That's Just right. for a bit of wanting vandalism. Right. Well, I, I know, for, on, I know, for, I know. But a year after, I was prejudiced in my work. I don't know, I lost a job. Oh, yeah. That's oh. all. Often that uh, doesn't matter. Like, uh, but I find myself even sort of blacklisted right there. Mm -hmm. There was definitely a cynicism and a, dis a dismissiveness in local media and national media. Well, the media are part of the problem. You see, we boast about free speech, but there's no point in having free speech if no one hears you, and if you can blank out what is being said or distorted, then you may have had the right to say it, but nobody knows about it. Newspaper editors and uh, even journalists decided not to cover the story because they politically disapproved of what we had done and therefore didn't want to give it any publicity. I'm not just saying this for ourselves, but I thought there were some really important things that happened in the trial. I mean, getting that Raytheon executive on the stand was absolutely astonishing. You know, you couldn't have made him up for somebody who was so contentious of protest of what was happening in the Middle East, says he never watches the news, didn't know really about what happened in Israel and Palestine. We defended ourselves on the basis that we were not criminals but attempting to stop a greater crime. Even talking directly to the police, they would sort of say, you know, sort of, oh, why, why have you done this and why are you using violence? And all of us were very keyed up on that thing about, you know, saying, no, this is non-violent direct action, but we are doing this in order to try and save, save human life and we believe there's a long political and moral tradition going back to the Nuremberg trials after the Second World War. The people who had bombed the railway tracks that led to the concentration camps in order to prevent the trains getting through were judged to have not committed a crime because they were trying to prevent the commission of a greater crime. That's our moral political justification. And we said to the court that we were in the position of someone who's walking along the street and who hears the sound of a child being brutalised in a house. If that person smashes down the door of the house I mean, strikes perhaps and assaults the abuser of the child. Could you say that that person is guilty of a crime? We say no, that person was attempting to stop a greater crime than breaking and entering. The greatest enemy that anybody has when they're opposing injustice is to feel that they're on their own. Whether you're in the middle of a conflict or whether you're just someone who feels that the world should be a better place, the biggest enemy is loneliness. 
all of us are susceptible to the idea we can't do anything, we're on our own. And therefore, anything that says you're not on your own, that is the most enormously influential thing you can do. When we went to Lebanon, and one of the things that surprised us was that quite a lot of people knew about the occupation of the Raytheon uh, company here. and uh, To come so close to what had happened and to see firsthand and meet firsthand the people who suffered in, in, in that situation was really, really humbling. In Cana we talked to uh, members of the two families. Uh, it was two extended families accounted for all the casualties. When you actually look into the eyes of the victims of something like this, it gives you sort of an understanding of it at a different level, at a far more human level. <laughs> seeing all the graves laid out, you know, it was an incredibly um, emotional thing. <coughs> Sorry. Um. It struck me really forcibly sitting talking to uh, Senna Shalom and other members of the Shalom family in their home uh, in Cana. This is just like Bloody Sunday. These are exactly the same feelings, sort of, and that this mixture of sort of grief and anger and also of forgiveness. Kana's just a small town, you know, sort of maybe a few thousand people. And Hala Shalub came down to speak to us. Hala had just told us the story of actually what had happened, you know, it sort of made it so real. There were a number of extended families, the Hashims and Shalubs, you know, just who lived in that little part, part of Kana. And there was one building that was sort of three stories and there was a basement in it. So they had been in the basement for 18 days. When the missile came through at night, everyone was sleeping. The feeling of that experience of a bunker buster bomb penetrating through a building and then going into the earth before exploding. The building came down on top of them, but also all the dirt on, underneath also came up all around them. Everyone was buried. Her mouth was full of dirt so she couldn't speak or couldn't call out. Her two daughters were lying sleeping beside her. From one of them she didn't hear ever again, but from Rukaya she did hear her trying to call. They took Rukaya to the neighbour's house, but she died there because the ambulances couldn't get through. You know, that, that was only one bomb, that was one family, and that happened, you know, for 34 days. So it was an incredibly humbling thing, but also, you know, I think just deepened all of our commitment. It made us feel even more confident that we would go into the, into the trial and uh, talk about it. And, um... Oops, sorry, I'm getting really overcome here, and I uh, don't, don't mean to. But, um... I remember, um... That, that uh, experience in Canada came... <clears throat> So it was a reminder sort of, um, of our common humanity and the fact that none of us is unique and no community is unique, however distinctive it is, and all the struggles and conflicts are, are different and the contexts are all different. But sort of when you get down to it, I mean, human beings are the same. Human beings are the same. That's one of the things we learned. And lots of people in Lebanon, in, both in Beirut and in southern Lebanon, were saying to us, you know, we thought we were on our own. The world wasn't listening to us. We couldn't understand why were we being bombed like this on a daily, hourly basis, and the world seemed to be ignoring it. And then we heard that, you know, what she had done and knew we weren't on mm -hmm. our own. And, you know, you don't think that when we did, it never occurred to us that people in Lebanon would actually get some strength from the fact that we'd done what was a relatively small thing here, really. Uh, the first time I came across the Raytheon protest, as far as I can remember, is I read an article about it and I remember thinking, oh, protest in Derry, because uh, I know Eamon McCann, I'm fairly certain that he's going to be in the middle of this. And also, because I know Eamon, I thought, oh, blimey, he's going to go to jail for this, isn't he? And then when he didn't, I just was, I thought this is marvellous. It was a very important event, the Raytheon judgment, because what a jury said was that you have no moral obligation to obey a law that is contrary to your conscience. Do you remember we got 
the not guilty stand in the dock. That's we, like, we didn't know oh, what, what yeah. way the jury. They were hard to judge, weren't they? they really were hard really to really judge, really right. And they took but so we long knew, to make the We, we kind of knew. We, you know, we during the trial every day, didn't we? Uh, then people became our people. That was. Right. <laughs> you know, some people in the anti-war movement were very uh, gloomy about our prospects in Belfast. That a jury in Belfast was uh, likely to have a majority of Protestants and who would tend to be Unionist, and uh, the perception in Jerry would be that that would be quite a right wing. But far from it. Far from it. I mean, after the first day, looking at the jury and the witness box, we're following it very closely. Even after a few days, we were confident if we can make our case convincing, these people in the jury are going to believe us and we're going to be acquitted. So we had a lot of trust in the jury after a few days, and that trust turned out to be justified. The fact that a group of protesters could make the sort of protest they made in Derry against this pernicious company go to trial and the jury and the judge go, yeah, all right, off you go. You were technically committing a crime, but it was in order to, to prevent a far greater crime, the crime of the arms companies. I think that's, um, that's an enormously optimistic message, I think, that's been sent out. People in Derry who opposed the occupation of the Raytheon plant made the point by occupying the Raytheon factory, we not only were running the risk of chasing Raytheon out of Derry, we would also deter similar companies from investing in Derry in the future. Attracting investment in Derry during the Troubles was uh, very, very difficult. You can't maybe lobby people to come to a war zone as easy as you come to people where there's peace. People think that these job opportunities walk to you, they don't. You have to go there looking for them. The Ford Motor Company are involved in war, they make tanks. So will we stop all driving Ford cars, Ford Fiestas and stuff, you know, where do you stop with this argument? There's one particular company who's been singled out, in my opinion, in that city. You know, you have to make a balance between the interests of Derry and having jobs on the one hand and the interests of the people of the world, if you like. We decided that the balance very firmly came down on the side of taking out the Raytheon plant, even at the, uh, with the possibility of risking the jobs in Derry. We weren't concerned about that. At a political level, um, I think the contortions that the, that the local politicians have gone through have been absolutely astonishing to see. The reaction of the local business class, the reaction of the local political class, I think it's just revealed that the involvement of the arms trade fundamentally is just so deeply corrupting of our society, of our politics. If you read sort of the statements of uh, Raytheon executives, uh, they actually speak in a political way about the Middle East, about the war on terror, saying that the war on terror is a necessary thing. They lobby explicitly for increased arms expenditure, particularly in the United States. I think it is quite possible that there will come a time in society when people look back on the arms trade and think, what are we doing? The more bombs that are dropped, the more bombs have to be replaced in the arsenals of the countries which are dropping the bombs. All arms companies have a business interest in bloodshed. We spent billions of pounds ensuring that these companies could construct landmines and heat-seeking missiles that could burn the retinas of anybody who got in the way, instantly blinding them in the most unimaginable agony. There were people who sat around and and cleverly devised this at the same time as there were millions of people around the world who just by virtue of the fate of where they were born were desperate for the most basic medicines and basic water and basic food that was being stockpiled in another bit of the world. The day will come fairly soon when people will look at the arms industry the way they look back now at the slave trade which supplied jobs, which supplied riches and prosperity to Western cities and countries. Congratulate ourselves, didn't we, on uh, especially Britain. We were the first to abolish slavery, I love that. We should be proud, the Conservative argument, we should be proud we were the first to abolish slavery, which just seems to miss out the one bit of that whole little conundrum that we could only abolish it because we were fucking doing it in the first place. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, only if Harold Shipman had stopped killing grannies just a few months before he was caught. I was the first doctor to stop killing grannies. Whee! Making the mayor. 
See, the way a change occurs in history is like this. To begin with, if you argue for something, votes for women, a good example, you're ignored. If you go on, you're mad. Better touch of that myself. If you go on, you're dangerous. Then there's a pause, and then you can't find anyone at the top who doesn't claim to have thought of it in the first place. That is how progress is made. And I think the Stop the War Coalition and the Raytheon campaign are examples. Ignored, mad, dangerous, and now everybody recognises you've got to go about the problems in a different way. But what we were doing really was sort of making a tiny contribution to what is an increasing movement around the world. In Britain alone, there are five or six uh, a locations at the moment where there are people picketing and demonstrating outside. In the United States, there are people uh, opposing and holding demonstrations against Raytheon. And since our action, we're in touch with those people. All of them contacted us. So we're in email contact with people sort of all over the world. Treat other people as you would like to be treated yourself. And that is the basic golden rule of world morality. And it's on trade union banners. An injury to one is an injury to all. We have a moral responsibility for each other. And when people actually put that into practice, they may well come into conflict with the law. Well, it's fairly obvious why we're protesting here today. Uh, we're in the middle of the Israeli onslaught in Gaza. We know that their F-16 fighters are dropping missiles on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And we're here um, the same way as we were in Le uh, during the Lebanese war in 2006 uh, to say that we don't want a company in our town that's complicit in the war crimes that have been carried out at the moment. To show support, solidarity with people in Palestine, people in Gaza and on the West Bank, and to say this is outrageous and it can't be done in our name. It's been done in our name because of the involvement of Raytheon. It's been done in our name because of the support that's been given to Israel. I think there's a lot of parallels with what happened in Lebanon in uh, 2006 and what's happening there, although I think it's much worse in, in, in Gaza. I stood outside factories in England and asked English workers not to make plastic bullets that were being used to kill children in Ireland. And I couldn't in all conscience do that and yet say that I'm indifferent to people making uh, things in my city that have been used to kill children somewhere else. What's happening here illustrates the need for activism. All attempts to uh, energise the major political parties have failed and we are left with no option. Our target is absolutely clear, our aim is absolutely clear by non-violent, peaceful, direct action to get Raytheon out of Derry. What we did in August 2006, it was all about that. It was all about trying to say that we would doing something to stand beside those people. Yeah. What I would say, what I would say, given the same circumstances, given the same climate again, I would do the exact same right. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And Definitely. I'll do it better. Definitely. Right. Right. Do more. Right. I think we've carried through the trial right. and everything, you know, that we, you know, and I hope that, you know, having a getting the victory and getting off give, give a lift to everybody that's involved yep. in you know, the war movement, you know, whatever it is that they can do, you know. And I think there are two flames burning in the human heart. The flame of anger against injustice and the flame of hope we could build a better world. And all the Raytheon did was to fan, the, the, those campaigns fanned both flames of hatred against war and hope that you could do something about it. A very important historical event. I think that none of us regrets, I certainly don't regret, uh, any part of it at all. Uh, although there were scary moments along the way, sort of in uh, times of uh, uh, apprehension, uh, a, 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 I mean, I've been involved in politics for more than 40 years uh, since the early days of the civil rights movement and the troubles uh, in Northern Ireland and uh, without any doubt uh, what we did at Raytheon was the best thing I've ever done in my life. safe cocoon What's this hard shell cover What have I been made to do Now they call me deadly Say that I'm to blame Even had some dream last night That I turn into flames If I am alone and soaring High above the crimson sand Say a prayer I think I'm falling Falling Falling, falling